and I have fond memories of uh, living in a two-story house at 107 Windham Road. And in front of the house we had a porch like a lot most people did, front yard porches, and on our porch we had a glider. And uh, mom, when the weather was good, uh, and we behaved, mom would say, okay, you want to eat for lunch out in the glider? Go ahead. So my brother, Leah, and I would cart ourselves off the porch, sit down, and swing back and forth in that glider and say hi as folks came by. We did those things in Rochester, New York. Well, this was back a few years ago. One of my favorite authors is Robert Polkin. And from among his books, he recounts the story of an older gentleman who was doing the same sort of thing. He would sit in his front porch in his glider. And he lived right in the corner of a dead end street, and his, uh, his neighbors would come and go. He'd, he'd say hi, and Boston, as the days would move along, and, and strangers would come into that neighborhood too. And he knew that within just a few minutes, he'd be waiting to him again. Because right at the corner of the street was a big sign that said it, Dead End Street! <laughs> dead End Street! Didn't make any difference what the sign said, came in anyway. As I reflect on what Robert was narrating in that story and in that memory of this older gentleman, it comes to me that a lot of us don't like facing the end of things. Maybe it's been facing the uncertainties of life following the loss of a job. Not just the loss of the income that job brought to the family and to our family budget, but the loss of a job that was fulfilling for us. It fed us and we enjoyed it, we loved it, and now we don't have it. And we fear it's a hand. We dread the end of uh, what has been for us. Maybe it's been the end of a marriage, or the end of a friendship, that we thought would last forever. Maybe it's been a dream, a dream ended by the facts of reality. I still think that endings get a bad rap. Because more often than not, they're not the culprits that we paint them to be. In reality, endings are intersections. They're intersections. And when there is a stop sign at an intersection, it doesn't mean that we stop, turn off the engine, get out and walk away. That's it. Forever, we stop. We stop, we pause. And go forward. We ask ourselves, all right, where do we go from here? Genesis 1. There are other creation stories in Genesis, but let's think about Genesis 1 creation story. And in that creation story, there is a description of God creating a day, a day, a day, a day. And at the end of each creating or creative paragraph, the sentence is, then there was evening, and then morning. That's how each creative paragraph in Genesis 1 concludes. There was evening, and then there was morning. At the intersection of night and day, when it's still dark, in the dark of night, God is already with new creative plans for the dawn of morning. And it's at the intersections of night and day where God does God's most remarkable and creative work. I know that's so for my life, and I would suspect maybe if you reflect on it, it's so for you. God's most creative acts are at the intersections of night and day. That's God's creation story, Genesis 1. But you and I, we have our own creation stories. They are defined by what we decide to do at our intersections of night and day. We will decide something. We will decide something. Life demands it. We can't avoid it. 
And the doctor told me and Patty that my cancer was very aggressive and uh, I didn't have a lot of time, maybe a year. I, I heard that news initially, it was like, well, of course he'd be joking, for both of us. Well, what really got to me is I was sitting in the doctor's office at UMC in Tucson, and then a doctor came in and, and he put the x-rays up on the wall and began to describe for me my cancer and what I should expect. And the chair I was sitting on didn't have a back. <laughs> I'm sure Patty remembers this. We were in the office and I was sitting in that chair and all of a sudden I, 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 I was feeling myself be very lightheaded. And the next thing I know, I'm flat on my back, I'm out cold, and, and as people get around me, Mr. Gardner, Mr. Gardner, are you all right? Are you all right, Mr. Gardner? <laughs> it had sunk in. I was terrible, I had a year to live, I had cancer. Let's face it, this is a tough nut we've got here. It's a tough journey, and it's just, in a moment, it was overwhelming. And I literally passed out. We have a choice. You have a choice, I have a choice. We have choices we make in moments like these intersections of night and day. We can choose to uh, deny it. We can choose to resent it. A dream has, has died because reality has set in and grasped and retooled. A marriage of friendship is gone. We can resent that. We can deny it. We can be angry about it. We can shut ourselves in the oblivion of pain, <coughs> doubt, Darkness, that is a choice. You can step back from relationships. The marriage or friendship has ended and it's been so painful. It's caused us to think, our relationship's worth it. There's too much pain and too much hurt. You decide not to step back to stay back. That is a choice. There's another option. You can dare to trust and to love again. We can step ourselves in the light of a new day. What we decide at these moments of intersection is our creation story. It's our creation story. We have multiple creation stories in life. They happen again and again and again. What we decide, long days to the night, brightness to the belief of the morning and the day. In our text from 2 Chronicles, uh, chapter 12, of the read from this morning ago, it describes a time in history when darkness, the darkness of a night, had settled upon Israel. The countryside and the streets of Israel were overcome like they were overcome like the locusts, like a plague of locusts. They were, they were inundated. They were obliterated. People died. Loved ones died. Families mourned. A nation full of dreamers felt now the sting of hard realities. Valuable treasures were taken away from the temple and the king's palace and you know, wherever they could be found as spoils of war. Among the treasures that the Egyptians carted back to Egypt were the shields, the golden shields. Catch the text that was read. The shields of gold were carted away. Maybe they were held in Egypt as, as prizes and put in a display case somewhere, or maybe they were melted down after all they were gold. When Egypt did that, they robbed the people of Israel, not, not just their material treasures, that they robbed their sense of optimism and hope. They robbed a sense of joy. Israel had been so happy. It had been such a festive time. When the king of Israel would move from his king's palace and the temple and through the streets of Jerusalem, there was shields of gold. It was like it was like Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. It was awesome. <laughs> Sing it, celebration. But none of that, not now. You remember 
the song from the 60s, and I know from looking out here there are a number of us that are of age. <laughs> <laughs> well, a song entitled American Pot. <clears throat> I'm not auditioning for choir. Rock the Ruby do this earlier, so I'm ready to, so you know I would not make the choir. But for those of you that don't remember, it went something like this. Bye bye, Miss American Pie. Remember that one? Sound familiar? Okay. Well, it's that the lyrics of that song went through. It came to the point where it said it was the day the music died. When the music died in the streets of Jerusalem, it did. The king of Israel, Rehoboam, did something strange, something surprising, something unexpected, certainly. He called his craftsmen in and he said, I want you to make new shields for us. These shields, of course, would be led by the guard as they would pray down through the streets. But they responded, that good king, we have no gold, we have nothing. Oh, we have bronze. Find some scraps now. And I want you to make some new shields. I know they're going to be bronze. I know it's a big come down from gold. But I want you to do it. I want you to make new shields. I don't care if they're bronze. I don't care what I, I want to do. They did it. Finally, the day came when they did, in fact, process from the temple, from the king's palace to the temple and through the streets. Now, there were a lot of people gathered for that day, and uh, maybe, maybe some were laughing. Are you kidding? Look at those shields. They're bronze. Who's he kidding? Those aren't gold shields. Those are bronze shields. I'm sure there were those who said that. But this is Rehoboam's day of creation. He's seeking to create something new, something exciting, something hopeful for the people. And so he played with the bronze shields. And I'm going to guess that most of the people knew what he was trying to do. And most of them appreciated his effort. You, O King, are trying. Are trying in the midst of our darkness, of our night. You're trying to bring some day light. Thanks. This wasn't an act just that Rahab was doing for himself. He was doing it for other folk. And, and so, as much as God calls us because it does begin with us. Do what we can to brighten our souls when we face the intersections that are personal to us. Um, instead of that, I need to say to you, I, I, that I, I don't have much left of saliva since following the radiation and surgery, so this is my little class. But if you think it's something else, really, it's quite innocent. <laughs> <laughs> but it does lubricate, so I can keep on talking. I'm too glad. Uh, now, Abraham wasn't doing that just for himself. God says to us, you're called to be a day person. It's how I created you. You are a day person. And we need to internalize that and wrestle with that for ourselves first. What does that mean for me personally? In my life, the choices, the decisions I make with the darkness in my life that I have to face, what do I do with it? It begins there. My decision. It becomes my creation day. What am I creating for myself and for those around me? And for those around me. Raven's creation story, with this story called the shoe, is to make us mindful that we are individuals living within community. We are part of community. We are part of a larger neighborhood. We are part of a society of people. And so, as earlier or later in Genesis would tell us, we've been blessed to be a blessing. So what are you going to do? I've called you to be a day person. You're wrestling that fairly well for yourself. Now, what are you going to do about that for others? I'm especially mindful of that. Not only is there scriptures and the great stories of scriptures, but I, 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 I just concluded reading a, a, a biography about uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. For those of you who don't know Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he's a young Lutheran minister uh, living and serving in the time of the Third Reich. 
Beginning in the 30s, neighborhoods across Germany were under assault. Jewish neighbors, disabled neighbors, gay neighbors were rounded up under the excuse that they were a drain on the German economy. The propaganda machine of the Third Reich had cleverly manipulated people's minds. Neighbors who used to be friends now found themselves divided and even suspicious of one another. The church was too quiet, too silent. But unlike so many within the church community of Germany, the young Dietrich Bonhoeffer, young theologian with doctorate degrees and preparing for ordination as a parish minister, couldn't stay silent. If you were to look at my Bible carefully, my grandson might do this uh, earlier. I had the joy of two months back to teach people in our daughter's wedding and looked at my Bible. Oh, Grandpa, that Bible's kind of falling apart. And it is. <laughs> the binding is all loose, and I had the Scott's tape pages together. And you think, God, why not? Why don't you get on the Bible? But, Uh, a person when I left the St. John Church in Tucson gave me a cover that I could house this Bible in. And inside it says, this is to take care of your good friend. Mm -hmm. This has become a good friend to me. I would miss, I, maybe you can see from there. I, throughout this Bible, I've got underlines and scorings and uh, footnotes. And I, 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 I don't know what I do with that. This, 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 this is my friend. I say that because I want you to hear Dietrich Bonhoeffer because this is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer would say to you. This is, this is my friend. This is how God speaks to me. <coughs> I can't pretend that I know the passages from which Dietrich Bonhoeffer drew all the courage of his convictions of faith. But I'm going to guess that Genesis, the Genesis creation story, our text from Chronicles, and now this text that comes to us in Thessalonians were among texts that fed his soul and gave him the conviction of his faith. We've heard something of Genesis, we've heard something of Chronicles. In Thessalonians, perhaps it says it the best of all when God says to us, You are sons and daughters of light. You are sons and daughters of day. You are not of night. You are not of darkness. That's you, and that's me. That's who God says we are. We're David. David Bonhoeffer, he died and was executed just two months before uh, Hitler's demise and the Allied forces uh, winning this great war. Just two months. See, got so close to my freedom. It can help over here. There was deep hatred in the minds of Hitler and his staff for what Dietrich Bonhoeffer dared to do. He dared to stand up to them. You will not get away with this. If we're going down, he's going down with us. And so he did. He was it. But his friends who survived him, who witnessed these last minutes of his life, they ever counted them in the book, biography about the book on. They said, you know, when he walked to the gallows, he went emanating the light of day. He went to the gallows emanating the light of day. Because he was a day person. He was living out who God had called him to be. We have these multiple intersections in our life. Do we give up? Do we deny? Do we hate? Do we live in our resentments? Do we live in darkness of night? Or do we choose to create a new morning, a new day? Our decisions will make a night 